Hi everyone, my name is Raquel Ortazon and I am the CEO and founder of Wabi. Cell driving is one of the most exciting technologies of our generation. It, it is really uh, going to transform the world as we know it today. It's going to bring safety to our roads. It's going to enable people to move from point A to point B that now they don't have means of transportation. And it's going to really uh, solve the supply chain and logistic crisis that we are, you know, we are all living today. Now, in order to really be able to bring this technology to market, we need to have a new uh, approach, a new generation, because current approaches haven't solved it. This is the reason why I founded Wabi, to develop this technology with the people that we love to work with. I founded the company a little bit over a year ago. We have offices in Toronto and San Francisco. And we have the opportunity as well of having remote uh, people working all over the place. We fundraised one of the largest series say, in Canada in order to uh, be able to develop this technology. And we have the you know, best in class investors, for example, deep technology with Costa Ventures, logistics with ABC and Uber, as well as the Canadian super thriving ecosystem. We have a very uh, differentiated uh, technology approach from our competitors, which is AI first and is very simulation centric. And today I'm gonna to show you a lot about, you know, how we do simulation, this next generation simulation at Wabi. We are laser focused into bringing this technology to market, um, uh, building a technology that scales uh, from day one. And in particular, focus on L4 tracking, tackling this logistics problem that we are all immersed into and with a model of have to have so that most of the uh, drives are actually on highway, which is easier to solve than if you look at robot taxis. Let's talk a little bit about how um, cell driving actually works. Typically, you will, you know, if you look at any uh, cell driving vehicle out there, um, it collects data from the sensors. This is showcased here with a later point cloud scene from the top. And typically, you will also have access to high definition maps such that when you perform localization, you can utilize these maps uh, that give you a lot of information about the surroundings of the vehicle. This is important because it's really hard to see really far with uh, current sensors and having a map can help you plan the right maneuver. Then the perception system typically, um, what it does is that it looks at raw sensor data and uh, is responsible for estimating uh, where the different actors are in the scene. Then we have motion forecasting of prediction where for every actor, we want to understand how it might be moving in the next few seconds into the future. We utilize all this information in order to be able to plan a safe maneuver that is comfortable towards the goal. And this is a process that typically repeats you know, every 100 milliseconds or so. Okay, this is in a nutshell how a driving vehicle typically works. Now, if we look a little bit into what has happened since the DARPA challenge, which is almost three, um, two decades ago, uh, we've seen meaningful progress and there's been some you know, interesting milestones. But when we look at commercial deployment, it's very, very limited to very small and very simple operation domains. So the promise of cell driving everywhere is definitely far from beyond there. Why is this the case? Well, the first thing to acknowledge is that this problem is really, really hard. And the reason why is that the driving problem is actually pretty nuisance in terms of that small variations in the input uh, can result in actions that should be very, very different. For example, if the vehicle in front of us is slamming on the brakes, we should have a very different behavior than if it's actually just driving straight. Now, if we look at the number of possible situations that we need to handle, this is there is exponentially many. Uh, and not only this number is actually very large, but it turns out that many of those situations, we are rarely exposed. Some of them, we might need to drive millions, billions of miles in order to see it even once, right? So we have a very long tail and you know, most of the events happen very, very infrequently. This makes it like a really hard problem. As I mentioned before, like, you know, there is you know, meaningful progress since the DARPA challenge, but we haven't seen really solutions that can solve this uh, problem at the scale, that can really generalize to deal with all these different scenarios that might occur. 
And in my opinion, the main reason for this uh, lies on the technology that uh, the industry is utilizing today, which is still very reminiscent to what the DARPA challenge looked like, uh, which basically it requires a lot of manual tuning, um, both in terms of the design and the processes to develop the technology uh, in terms of the software stack, but also in the way that uh, the industry is doing testing in order to understand where the possible problems are and in order to verify and potentially make the safety case uh, when the potentially the system is able to be deployed without a driver in the real world, right? Uh, the, the main way that the industry is doing this is just by driving millions of miles of the real world. So this is something that doesn't escape, right? And the better that your system gets, the least, uh, you know, less situations you're going to be exposed, the less you know about whether you can handle some of these rare cases. Right? So we need a different approach. In terms of the brain of the self-driving vehicle, Wabi has a very differentiated, unique approach that is AI first, meaning that we're going to be able to train the system end to end, but at the same time, it's modular and it's interpretable such that we can validate and verify the system, which is something very, very important for safety critical applications like self-driving. Also, it's important that if, uh, you know, in the event of an, you know, the vehicle doing something that is uh, non-optimal, we can trace back into why the system made the, that particular decision. However, the automation, the fact that you can train end to end, uh, enables you to really have is you know a developer productivity that is so much higher than what we see in the industry, where in this manually um, tuned software stacks that are overly complicated and very very brittle, typically landing a change will take a quarter two quarters, where for us we can make changes every single day. So the speed of iteration, the speed that you can you know uh, get better and better models is uh, you know game changer in terms of uh, having the ability to end-to-end -end, uh, train the stack. The other advantage is that you are actually directly optimizing for the system of the metrics, which is what you care about, which is the task of driving safely, not about you know, how your perception system might actually see all the different actors perfectly, which is not oftentimes not uh, correlated with um, how well you drive in the real world. This approach is also very, very scalable uh, and is capable of very complex reasoning. And in particular, we use a combination of deep learning, uh, probabilistic inference, and complex optimization uh, in order of, you know, this is the combination of the different models that we see uh, in our software stack. And the entire set can actually be trained together, which is very, very exciting, both using a combination of uh, real world data as well as in simulation in either of the two or in a combination of the two. And this results in an approach that is much more affordable um, than what we see out there in the industry where typically you know, different companies have invested already billions of dollars uh, and they're still very far from the promise of self-driving. So it's very, very exciting what we are doing in terms of the, um, the brain of the self-driving vehicle. But today I'm gonna be talking to you about our simulation, which is the other very exciting key differentiator that is, you know, a game changer in terms of uh, where the industry is today. And this simulator is very important that we can use it for both testing uh, the entire system, as well as in order to train uh, the entire system as well in simulation. All right, so let's go over uh, in more details about how simulation works in the industry and then I will contrast into how we do simulation at Wabi. Um, today in the industry, like most players utilize not one simulator, but they utilize a set of simulators in order you know, to have like different tools to try to understand potentially where, uh, you know, where the system is not performant. And in particular, um, you know, I will go over these three types of, uh, the, the three types of simulators that are more, uh, more uh, readily employed. Um, the first type is what is called log replay, which I would argue that it's not really simulation, but typically it's called a simulation in the industry. So this is why it's here. And in this log replay, so basically you have collected data uh, in the real world, whether it's driving manually or driving in autonomy, 
And then what you're going to do is you're going to replay that data and then see uh, how your new system uh, that you are under test is going to perform in terms of perception, prediction, motion plan. Now, the good thing about this is that um, you have uh, access to raw sensor data that were recorded before. Therefore, it's very realistic. However, this system is not reactive, meaning that you are not really testing the consequences of your actions. Um, and, and therefore, there is like very little information beyond perception that you can or prediction that you can really get uh, with this type of simulation. Right? You're just replaying, you're just watching a, watching a video, right? So there is no understanding of how, for example, a chain of small mistakes can be catastrophic in your system. So this gives you, you know, some information about you know, some potential issues or regressions, but it's not really a tool that will replace driving in the real world. The second type of simulation that is also very employed in the industry is virtual simulation where the input to the simulator is typically a scenario that is an abstraction of uh, a potential situation. And this uh, typically will be bounding boxes representing the different actors, um, as well as their potential behaviors. And typically, you will have a structured testing of you know, a set of scenarios that are testing certain capabilities of the motion plan. Right? And the good thing about this is that it's reactive, meaning that the actors potentially going to react to you um, uh, and as a consequence, you're going to see what is the effect as you are driving of the different actions that you make. For example, if you're going to go off the road or you're going to get into a collision or in a situation that is not, uh, is not desirable, right? With log replay, you can't get into these situations because you're just replaying data that was captured before. And most likely that was not a situation that was uh, you know, too critical. Now, the, the problem with this type of approach of this uh, uh, simulation of uh, just uh, being able to test the motion planner is that you're only looking at one specific piece of the software stack. Furthermore, the input is typically either perfect or very, with very simplistic noise. So there is no way that you can understand um, how errors in perception and prediction can actually affect uh, the decisions that uh, you know, your motion planner might make. So as a consequence, this is used as a tool, uh, but again, it cannot uh, be a substitute for years driving these millions of miles of the real world. The third uh, type of um, yeah, simulation that we see in, in the industry as well, this is typically more on research mode and not necessarily really used in production, but uh, companies are starting to invest into having access to game engines and then be able to generate data for training perception, uh, perception systems typically. And these are virtual worlds built by artists that uh, with uh, game engines that render them and give you, uh, for example, you know, sensor simulations of uh, cameras in this case, as well as automatic labels, right? In this case, a semantic segmentation is shown with Carla simulator here. Now, these approaches are not really scalable because humans have to create these, uh, these virtual worlds. They are not very realistic, right? They look cool, but uh, for neural networks, for uh, you know, our perception systems, uh, you know, the, uh, there is a big domain gap um, and they are lacking diversity because there is typically only a few assets that uh, you, know, you will see uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this simulator. Right. So, uh, so the consequence of this is that, you know, they are prototypes, they're not really employed in production. And when you see them, uh, the only maybe place where they might be useful is for like really rare classes, for example, uh, if you want to get additional data for, say, um, emergency vehicles. Right. So, so, so what's happening then in the industry is that, well, as you see in this pyramid here on the left, uh, there is use of simulation with all these different tools, uh, but that's not giving you so much information about how safe your system is. And then you need to go to a uh, closed course. This is the test track in order to further do testing. And um, since that is not scalable, right, because it's very expensive and you can only do, say, a handful of tests every day, uh, then typically people rely on just driving millions of miles of the real world in order to see where possible mistakes are. This is very expensive, and this is far from being the safest solution. 
right? You shouldn't be looking at where potential issues are when you go in public roads, right? That's, um, that's definitely not the best, uh, best option. Um, so with the um, uh, next generation simulator that I'm gonna show you in a second that Wabi has, we can invert this pyramid where now we're gonna be able to really substitute the need for driving uh, uh, all these miles in the real world by having a simulator that is a single simulator that can really simulate the entire process, including the sensors in real time, immersive and reactive manner, like with almost no domain gap, such that we can really test very, very extensively in simulation and really get um, a very good understanding of what the system performs well and what the system doesn't perform well. Then we can do a little bit of cross course testing and then our need for validation in the real world is much, much smaller than in the rest of the industry. So we're really inverting this pyramid, having a much safer, much more scalable, much faster and efficient solution to get, right? Because if you wanna rely on just driving, you know, miles in the real world, you're gonna need to drive so much in order to see a lot of those red events, right? Well, in simulation, we can just directly create in them, uh, you know, without waiting a single second. All right, so let me show you uh, the following video of uh, our simulator. Hopefully this plays with all of you. Ever think about what it really takes to drive? Probably not. We learn it, then we just do it. Stop. Think about it. Driving is hard. We process things quickly. React instantly. Our brains do this so well, it's mind-blowing. At Wabi, we're teaching the brain of a self-driving vehicle to do the same, but even better. This brain is virtual. Picture lines of code, like the matrix. We call it the Wabi driver, but it still needs access to experiences to learn like us. That can't happen entirely out on the road. It would take thousands of self-driving vehicles driving millions of miles for thousands of years to experience everything necessary to drive safely. After all, there are many things that happen very rarely. We need another way. That's why we made Wabi World, our high fidelity driving simulator, or simply put, the ultimate school for self-driving vehicles. Let's take a look inside. First, Wabi World reconstructs from real life sensor data. We can automatically reconstruct objects such as cars, SUVs, trucks, and more. It can digitally recreate reality as seen or even modify it to create an endless number of diverse virtual worlds. And we can do this across different sensor configurations as though the driver were in a car or even a truck, all automatically and at scale. We drop the Wabi driver into these simulated virtual worlds and it can see and behave exactly as it would in the real world. Wabi World can then create traffic scenarios to test the Wabi driver and generate all kinds of variations. We can create scenarios that mimic a calm afternoon or morning rush hour, two lane interstates or five lane freeways, all while reacting in real time to the Wabi driver's behavior to create interesting interactions. It's kind of like playing a video game where every action has a reaction. The Wabi driver makes a choice, traffic reacts. But unlike a video game, Wabi World can multiply and evolve scenarios infinitely. We can also evaluate how the Wabi driver performs in simulation and use AI to automatically generate challenging and realistic scenarios. Wabi World doesn't just test the driver to its limits, but also helps it learn new skills. Initially, the novice driver has difficulty in a scenario. But over time, Wabi World can be an instructor and help the driver get better. So ultimately, the Wabi driver will learn on its own to drive safely in any vehicle, in any scenario, anywhere in the world. 
Ever think about what it really takes to drive? At Wabi, we have. And Wabi World is our answer. All right, so now that you have seen the video, let's look at how this is really done. Um, so the first thing to think about is, what is the type of simulator that we need in order to really replace driving in the real world? So we need something that mimics exactly the same process, right? So it has to be like playing a video game where every one of our actions has a reaction on the environment. It has to be immersive such that the input to the software stack is the same type as if it was driving in the real world. So we need to simulate how cameras, radar, radar will have observed the world, the scene that we are uh, currently driving on the simulator. As I mentioned before, it has to be reactive, right? So that we understand how our actions impact the potential behaviors and actions that we will do in the future. It has to be at scale and it has to have all the diversity of uh, real world driving in terms of the scenarios, in terms of the appearance, instead of weather conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing that we need to have is also a way to automatically evaluate how well we do in the simulation, right? Because we wanna, draw, we wanna be able to run millions, billions of these simulations, right? And the simulator has to be very efficient such that you know, it can mimic the real time or near real time behavior of if we were driving in the real world. Okay, so these are all the characteristics that we have well, with Wabi World, all right? Where we have Wabi Driver, which is in this case, a software stack that we are testing, right? We have a representation of the world states. Given this, we can simulate with the sensors that is given as input, right? As the vehicle that is observing the scene is gonna decide on a maneuver. Then we're gonna uh, move that vehicle also according to some physics and things because what we intend to execute is not exactly what happens you know when you drive in the real world right then we the different actors are going to react to our actions and we're going to re-update the world state right and we continue to do this closed loop simulation and then we can utilize the updated world state in order to understand how well our actions were as we are actually executing them that's the evaluator that automatically give us metrics of how well the system behaves. Wabi World is built on four key capabilities or components that are necessary to have all of these components together in order to really build this next generation simulation. On the center here, you have the ability to reconstruct every single environment, including the dynamic objects as you're driving from raw sensor data. This is the way that you can get scale uh, in terms of in incorporating, you know, as many virtual worlds as the world, ex the, you know, the world in front of you. We have the ability to perform sensor simulation, right, with, uh, in this case, uh, later as well as cameras. Uh, the ability to perform, uh, uh, to create scenarios, right, so that it can test, you know, the entire software stack and the ability to learn in simulation. Okay, let me give you a little bit of flavor of all these different capabilities. Um, in order to build the, uh, the virtual world, the industry is looking into using artists uh, that by hand create uh, the different assets. And then there is a little bit of procedural modeling, which is a very simplistic uh, automation technique in order to replicate the world to create larger worlds. So there is no way that you can get diversity and the level of realism that you need with such an approach. Right? And you know, artists are very expensive, humans are expensive, right? So we need something different. Our approach is to utilize raw sensor data captured by any platform that is driving using ladars, a LADAR and camera. And then from that automatically reconstruct, thanks to our, uh, our AI algorithms, reconstruct the environment, including every single dynamic object. And we can do this at a scale for any, uh, any situation that we encounter as we drive around the world, right? So this gives you the diversity, the realism, um, the ability to really capture the entire world. So this can be used in order to create a catalog of possible dynamic objects, static objects, as well as environments. And then we're gonna create new worlds, new situations, utilizing this catalog as the basis. In terms of our uh, sensor simulation, it's important that it has to work in basically real time or near real time. And it has to be like super high fidelity. If we look at what the industry is doing, typically they employ physics-based simulation that are 
very uh, typically very slow or not uh, you know, sufficiently high fidelity. Um, and they, they also um, uh, put a lot of uh, you know, difficult requirements in terms of how much you need to know about every asset or the environment in order to be able to simulate any of the phenomena, for example. If you want to simulate rain, some of the simulators require you to actually model every single drop of rain, right? That's something that is very, very hard to scale. In Wabi World, we have a very different approach, which is we use a combination of AI and physics in order to develop a new generation of algorithms, where the idea is that the um, physics uh, show or provide with a representation that is you know, almost there, but not like enough realism. And then AI as the last bit will basically converse that rough physics into something that is super, super realistic and has much less requirements in terms of what you need to know the real world, right? So this is much more scalable. So let me show you um, in this video here, our little simulation on the left, camera simulation on the right. And what we're gonna do is You know, creating uh, scenarios that are maybe safety critical by inserting, you know, actors that are going to ask or are going to require us to react in order to be able to safely drive in the world. But obviously, we need to do more than just uh, insert actors, right? Uh, we need to be able to just yes, regenerate, uh, you know, different. Uh, uh, camera uh, or later uh, locations and different uh, you know, satellite and vehicle trajectories because we want to do this in closed loop. So let me show you uh, how we can do this. So I'm going to show you first a single log that we use as input for our virtual world creation. Um, and this log is just you know, generally camera and later you know, captured by just driving around. So you see us here uh, driving around a street in San Francisco, right? Um, and what we're going to do with this is we're going to automatically remove every single dynamic object. And we're going to create a 3D virtual world uh, from the rest of the scene. And then we're going to re-simulate yeah, how the vehicle, uh, while performing different trajectories, would have observed this scene if you were to drive differently. Okay, So let's look at this. Um, so this is now our camera simulation, right? That is. Uh, it has removed all the different moving actors. And now we can go and then do different um, configurations. For example, what if we were driving in a different lane, as you see, left to right motion, right? What if we were driving uh, slower? What if we were driving with a different frame rate or a different camera um, characteristic than the original one, right? As you see, it's extremely realistic. And we can do this just from a single log. Um, and we can go further. And then in this case, now we're going to simulate also uh, perspective uh, as if we change platforms, for example, from a car that was the one that captured the original scene to now uh, if we have a truck, which is what, you know, for logistics, we're actually uh, working on and how we will uh, observe the scene in this particular case, right? So we can really generalize across very different viewpoints from the original capture uh, in a way that we can create camera simulation that, as you see over here, is really, really realistic. All right, so uh, I'll show you some examples of how we can, uh, uh, we can simulate uh, the sensors. Let's go into how we can uh, create scenarios in Wobby World. Um, and in particular, we want to uh, create these scenarios, and they're going to be in 3D, and we can generate you know, the camera simulation, later simulation for any of these scenarios. But I'm going to showcase them with a different um, kind of a, a different depiction so that you know, there is not too much uh, information in the screen here. Okay? So the scenarios that uh, we want to create are such that we want the actors to be reactive, right? Because depending on our actions, uh, they would have done something different if they were to drive this. So they have to be intelligent. Um, so a core component of what we will is, you know, the zoo of uh, um, intelligent actors that we have. Then um, the way that we generate the scenarios is actually fourfold. Um, the, in the industry, you see a lot of yes, scripted scenarios where they're testing specific capabilities. For us, uh, you can easily create uh, scenarios in a scripted manner, for example, uh, in a programmatic manner, so that, you know, uh, in a few seconds, you can create, uh, you know, the scenario that you're interested in testing. For example, if you're a test engineer, 
prior a safety engineer. Uh, but we can also create the scenarios by um, uh, importing automatically from real world logs the scenarios that happen, and then modifying potentially these scenarios. Like in this case, uh, this actor in pink is modified so that uh, you know the actors have a different behavior now. And then we can test, uh, you know, how we will have reacted if the actors that we observe in the scene were to do something that are different from what they did in the original log. Okay, so this is the ability to create reactive log replay, which is something that you know you don't see in the industry and it's necessary. Uh, what else can we do? Um, we can also generate. Um, we have, I guess, deep generative models of. Uh, you know, the multi-agent uh, that can generate uh, traffic situations uh, from different traffic conditions to uh, also how this traffic uh, will be in uh, different, um, we can generate different maps uh, and, you know, different traffic situations within, uh, within those maps, right? So this gives you the ability to generate an uh, infinite number of scenarios with uh, different situations in different geographies. Um, which is important for testing, for example, the how well you can generalize your system. And the last bit that we can do is create the scenarios in an adversarial manner. And this is also very important because as your software stack gets better, um, you're gonna pass most of the scenarios, if not, if not all, right? And then you require more and more scenarios in order to find your issues, right? This, you can go from millions to billions, right? So this is computationally not feasible, right? Um, so what you need is a way to automate finding your mistakes. And we do this by creating adversarial uh, examples where here the adversaries are the agents in the scene. Okay, and here what you can see is a scenario where basically somebody is gonna encroach very closely to us and creating a situation that is hard for the, in this particular um, you know, software stack to handle. Okay, so this is the way that we can discover this automatically uh, just by running the adversarial mode. And it's actually very, very simple from a technology perspective in the sense that you know, we have the evaluator that tells us how well we do as we are uh, you know, driving in the different scenarios. And this is utilized uh, if by the simulator in order to transform the actors into adversaries. And then basically as a feedback loop, uh, these adversaries learn what is difficult for us by just looking at how well we behave as we are driving in the simulator. So this is a you know, pretty nice uh, way to automate the entire uh, adversarial creation process. And, and it's interesting that you know, simulation is oftentimes referred or, or uh, think about in the context of just yes, software testing, but simulation is much more than that. Um, one of the things that we use a simulator uh, for is actually to uh, have a, uh, the hardware and software team to be working together uh, in a single, uh, as a single team. Um, so let me explain you uh, this in the context of how it's done in the industry. So typically you will have hardware team creates a, say the next generation of vehicle platform, including you know, the sensor kit where the different sensors are and what they are. Then once this is created after the design and the fabrication, then the software team needs to adjust the software so that it's compatible with this uh, new configuration. And um, you know, this is a process that takes you know, quite a bit of time, right? And then they have to validate this process by driving in the real world again by another you know, couple of million of miles or whatever it is for that particular um, uh, industry player, right? And typically what they will discover is that some of the choices were not optimal uh, and they have to you know, make some changes and then go back uh, and reiterate the process. Every one of these iterations typically takes between a year to two years, right? So it's a very, very slow process. By using the, our simulator, what we can do is change this process fully so that hardware and software are integrated. And it's a very, very efficient process. So instead, what we can do is, thanks to our sensor simulation technology, we can test many possible hardware platforms in simulation. Select the one that actually performs the best in terms of system level metrics. Then that's the one that is gonna be fabricated. And then we just need to do a little bit of validation in the real world. And we have a new hardware platform that is actually uh, you know, much closer to being optimal than if we use a traditional approach. And this is something that we can do very, very quickly in a couple 
couple of sprints instead of you know having one to two years okay and the technology employed for this is something that i showed you before i wanted to look at the top uh, part of the video where basically uh, you know we capture you know our virtual world with some sensors right but then we can regenerate the scenarios uh, by changing in this case if you look at the top uh, from a viewpoint of a data a single later on a car to two laters mounted on top of a truck right and then we can test the entire system train and test the entire system this way right for this new configuration before we ever build for example a truck and on the bottom, uh, what you can see is the same idea, but if, you know, with one of the cameras that I simulated that goes from uh, being on a car to being on the track, right? So the viewpoint is actually changed uh, from the bottom right to the top. Let me play it again. Uh, well, basically now we are changing viewpoint and then we can simulate you know, our camera data um, to be super realistic this way. So this is a game changer in the industry. Um, the last bit, right, is that we can not just, you know, test, uh, uh, you know, the safety critical situations and all the scenarios at the scale and interleave the software hardware process and work together. Uh, but furthermore, we can train in simulation. And the idea of training in simulation is very simple, is that every time that you are interacting in a scenario, you can basically, thanks to this evaluator, you can provide feedback to the driver, the Wabi driver, which is our AI system that utilizes this in order to rewire its brain uh, every time it sees a scenario, every time it, um, it uh, is actually playing in the scenario, right? Really performing its actions in the scenario. And we can do this in the cloud at the scale distributed uh, so that we observe you know, a myriad of situations at once. So this is very, very effective and efficient in terms of learning. All right, and what you can see here in the video is at the beginning, you know, it's a very naive uh, planner, so you know, it can get into collisions. And uh, as it's experiencing the scenarios, it's learning better and better policies. In this case, uh, you know, it's still not perfect, right? Before, uh, it doesn't learn to yet to accelerate in order to be able to merge better, but after it repeats a couple of times, actually learns that complex behavior. All right, so having this simulator really enabled us to uh, remove the, the need to drive these millions of miles in order to understand how our system is doing. And instead, we can do it much safer, much more with a, this much more affordable solution. So, uh, just to summarize, the promise of self driving uh, is really the promise of a better world. And it's going to happen, and it's going to happen, I would say, fairly soon. And it's a very, very exciting to be part of this you know, revolution of really bringing this technology to market. Uh, but we believe that in order to really bring this at the scale, you need this uh, new technology. Today, I show you our next generation simulator that is you know, the best simulator out there uh, you know, by, you know, by far in the industry, which is really this missing piece in order to test and train the system. If you're excited, come and join us. We are hiring a lot these days. Um, so please, uh, you know, shoot me an email or you can see here access to our web page, okay, in terms of jobs. Um, this is all for me today uh, and hope to work with you in the future. <laughs>